<laughs> Action. <laughs> All right, yeah. All right. Well, uh, Jim and Deborah are back, so they are, yeah. I would have I would have bet on that. I would have bet on that. Somebody somebody would have asked me, hey, you think they're going to be back tonight? I would have bet on that. I, I think I could have cleaned up because I knew y'all would be back. I know y'all would be back. I said, yeah, they'll be back. They'll be burning the road up. What time did y'all leave today? About 10 o'clock this morning. Uh, I figured so. Yeah. Did, were, were you able to see anything in the service or anything, yeah. or did y'all pan? No, y'all we have no good phones. You have no good phone. We can no, get that. We have no good phone, sir. Oh. We don't get service until we get back to Jackson. Oh, really? And then it's and even now. Kind of spotty from Jackson. Man, what kind of what kind of it's service? Sprint. It's Sprint. It's Sprint. No, it's no, no well, Century. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, Sprint got a negative commercial on the internet. <laughs> Yeah. That'll go. That'll go viral. Yeah, oh, <laughs> there you go. Viral. Yeah, there you go. Sprint ain't no good. That'll go viral. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, I guess everybody's all right today, huh? You, you see the Saints won. How many? No. How many? How many Saints fans? I, well, I'm with you. I, I I saw that they won the game, uh, which is unusual, really. You know, because they've really been bad. And that's just amazing to me how somebody can be so bad three weeks in a row and then finally win a game. I mean, why, why does that, I mean, you know, what, how does that happen? They all of a sudden look like a team. Yeah, well, maybe so. But it was Cam Newton and Carolina Panthers, man. I mean, you know. Yeah, so they should have done something, but they, phew, the Saints put it on them. They sure did. They look like a real team. I don't know what's wrong with them. Something messed up with them, I huh? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I guess so. Oh me. Well, all right. Everybody's everybody's got to. I see y'all uh, studied your lesson tonight, right? The last five of the mouth. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. The last five of the mouth. Uh, that we need so much. I'm telling you, this mouth. Everything about it is just. Uh, we we really, you know, that that's really a big part of our lives. And and I guarantee you that there are so many things that are critical about the way the way we talk about things, the way we talk to others, uh, the things that we don't say, you know, that, that are part of our communication. You know, 65% of all communication is nonverbal. And I know you've heard me say that so many times. You go, yeah, I've heard that. But it's, it's the truth. Uh, we communicate so many things without even saying anything. Our body language, our facial expressions, Tanya told me that I, my face, I, you know, I, I couldn't, uh, I can't, she won't let me talk to certain people or certain things about at times because she says there's no way that you're going to be able to hide the fact that you're disgusted or you're angry or you're, you know, by, by just, uh, I mean, you'll be saying it with your mouth, you know, and, and but your, your facial expressions will be saying something else. And, um, you know, that's just part of it. And <laughs> that's just part of it. <laughs> Don't let Lawrence get in on the teaching tonight. Because, no, he ain't, he ain't, he's not a bee, so he can't get in on any of that. <laughs> Ain't no telling. Yeah, he's trying to he's trying to trying to slip in, yeah, because he can't get in. But uh, anyway, so let's uh, let's look at what we what we're in tonight. We're starting on Law Six, which is the Law of the Covenant, uh, which deals with uh, basically uh, paying attention and being careful what you say because when you say things to people, it's a, it's it's a form of a covenant. Uh, and I know that that might sound a little drastic. It might sound like a little overkill to say that when you make somebody a promise, whether you intend to make them a promise or not, they'll take it as a promise, that really you speak words and your words are a covenant. And uh, Psalm eighty nine thirty four, which is should be on your scripture sheet, uh, says, My covenant I will not break nor alter the words that have gone forth out of my lips. Those are covenant words. Uh, alter the words that you speak. Uh, change the covenant, uh, break the covenant, those kind of things. Those are all covenant, covenant talks. And, um, and most of us, or many of us in this room, grew up in a day where uh, our word was a covenant, where, you know, the statement was, my word is my bond. Amen. 
Um, I grew up in a day when early in my life, you could borrow money from the bank on a handshake, you know, and my grandparents, uh, you know, they, they did all of their dealings. They didn't have any paperwork and power of attorneys and notaries and all that kind of stuff. I mean, they just, you know, they would shake hands and, 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 and that would be, be the covenant. And, uh, I don't know how many of you remember the men's ministry. It, it might be still going. I just hadn't traveled in that kind of circle of promise keepers. Uh, is that still going? Uh, we used to be a part of it many years ago in a former church. We, we even went to Washington with promise keepers. You remember when all the promise keepers went to Washington, the men's ministry called promise keepers, went to Washington, and it was about two, it was close to two million men up there. They, I've got a picture at home, a big poster of it, and all the way from the Lincoln Memorial, just to give you an idea, from the Lincoln Memorial, uh, which is where the, the pool is where far, uh, in uh, Forrest Gump, you know, where they waded across the pool, that's right by the Lincoln Memorial. Then about halfway to the steps of the Capitol is the Washington Monument, and then, and then on uh, another mile or two <laughs> see, is the Washington Monument. And, I mean, is the, the steps of the Capitol building. Well, the stage was set up at the steps of the Capitol building. And it was supposed to start at 12 noon. We got there, our men's group, we had a bus with about 65 men from our church on it. And we got to Washington about uh, 4 o'clock in the morning. And we got off our bus and rode the little subways and stuff to get to the 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 capital area they call it the they call it a mall they call it grass they call it a mall but uh it was just open it's just open grass you know park to, and it's probably gosh half a mile wide roughly from one street to the other street you know you got your the museum um over here and then you got office buildings and in between you got about a half mile almost of grass and so forth it starts the capital steps and we got there, we got to the actual site at about 5.30 in the morning. It was still dark. And there were already so many people there that when we got there at 5.30, now remember, it's supposed to start at 12 noon. We're there at 5.30 in the morning before it even got sunlight. And we are sitting, they had to set up speaker stands every quarter of a mile. Every quarter of a mile, there was a big array, giant scaffolding, an array of speakers so that everybody could hear what was going on way, way up there. We were at the second set of scaffolding. That means we were a half mile away from the stage, and we were there at 530 in the morning, and it didn't start till noon. So that shows you how many guys were there. It was, and they went all the way from there. Then you have about another quarter of a mile to the Washington Monument. Then you got about another half mile or more to the Lincoln Memorial down there. And it was all wall to wall, packs, tight, solid men. I mean, you'd be sitting there. You wouldn't even have a place. If you fell over backwards, you'd fall on somebody, you know? I mean, that's how tight it was packed. And, and those men were called, and it was a movement called Promise Keepers. And that's where those kind of uh, sentiments come from, that, uh, that a man's word is, is bond and that being a promise keeper is an extremely important thing to keep your promises. And in a family, in a church or business or anything that you're uh, associated with, it's very important. This law says it's very important that you would keep your promises. If you tell somebody that you're going to meet them at the mall at 5 o'clock by the fountain, that you need to meet them at the mall at 5 o'clock by the fountain. You don't, they don't need to get there and be hanging out for 15, 20 minutes and, and saying, where are you and what's going on? And, what, and then see you later and say, man, I was waiting at the fountain. What do you, you know show? And they said, well, I tried to text you. No, no. If you, if you didn't get them, you need to show up at 5 o'clock at the fountain like you said you would do. Because uh, covenants are very important things, and, and it's very important that that as the fa if the family's going to function, you're, the people that you are with, that you trust, that trust you, it's important that you, that you keep your word and that you keep the covenant that you said. Don't say things that you don't intend to keep. Uh, it undermines the security of, of, uh, of people who are dependent on your word. Now, I know I'm talking to the wrong group of people here because all of you guys are most likely brought up in the generation where you were taught to keep your word. 
But I'm going to tell you what, we're living in a generation now that those, those jokers, they, it, they might as well be talking to that wall over there. Right. I mean, it's like they'll say something and have no intention of doing whatever it was and never even think of it again. And then when you have the audacity to get on to them about it, they want to act all shocked, like, what, you know, what, and, and what the Scripture teaches us is that it's very important that you do what you say because it builds a certain amount of security in the people that you have dealings with. I tell you who never forgets a promise that you make, your children. <laughs> right? Your children, you don't even have to really make a promise with your children. You, you can just, uh, they, yeah, they can say, uh, hey, can we go down to the mall later? And you say, well, we'll see about it. And they'll say, oh, righty, yeah, 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 it's on. Unless you really just distinctly, absolutely say, no, there's no possible way we're going to do that, and don't ask me again kind of deal. Um, they'll take that as a promise. And, and so words are, are very powerful, and we're to pay attention to what we say and don't make vows that we don't plan to keep. Uh, I've heard so many parents say, man, I want my children to grow up and keep their word. I want them to learn how to keep their word. Well, if you want them to learn how to keep their word, then you need to keep your word because you are an example to them. And Remember that character is something that is caught, not taught. In other words, there's no do as I say do. They're going to do as you do. So if you want them to tell the truth, you want them to keep their covenant, you want them to stay bounded to their words, then uh, you have to be a person of, of, your, of your word. Listen. Yeah. I have found that you have to, with children, you have to be the example of the Right. Because if it's wrong, it comes back on you. They remember everything that we say as, as growing up. Mm -hmm. And so it, it took me a couple of kids to get to it. <laughs> how, how it I like it. It took me a couple of kids. It, 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 I like that. Yeah. yeah. I, I told my kids, all of them, I didn't have no experience with kids before the first one. Right. And so then when the second one came, I had no experience with boys. Right. The first one was a girl, and the next one was a boy. Oh, my. So I'm learning. Right. But I do, I, 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 I do remember, and even even now, that at this age that I am, I still am very careful about what I say to them. Yeah. Because it can't come back to fight you, and it can't come back for other things. And they remember. Mm -hmm. and, you, and I've always wanted to be a person of my word. Right. I've been very careful. When I say whatever it is, it's meant. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I try to be careful what I say. And that's exactly right. And that's what this law is really all about. It's about the fact that, that, that we're to remember. And, and I know, you know, it sounds kind of drastic and it sounds like, okay, you're making really too much out of this. But, but, but the Lord teaches us in his word that covenants are vital to life, that, that we have covenants with people that we have relationship to. And when the covenant is violated, then it, it creates an, a certain amount of insecurity in the relationship. It's like, okay, uh, can, I, can I trust them? You know, I mean, are they, are, when they say this to me, do, is that going to, are they going to stand behind that? Is it going to be, is this somebody that I can depend on? Because really, to be honest, you know, in all of our lives, in, in, in all of us, we need people that we can depend on. Right. Now, we know because of experience and because we've had so many failures in, in that area of life that there are some people that we already know we can't depend on what they say about anything because they're just talking to the wind. Now, we don't want that to be somebody we really love and, and have, have a sense of responsibility for, like our children or our grandchildren or somebody, our mate, you know. We don't want that to be them. But, we, you know, we, we just understand that and we let that slide because there's not a lot that we can do to change it. But we all need people in our lives that we can count on, people that when they say something to you, that boom, that's what they mean, 
And if it hair lips, we used to <laughs> we used to have a saying: if it hair lips the queen, uh, you know, <laughs> then then I mean we gonna get, it's gonna get her done, you know, regardless. Uh, in other words, that's a way of saying. It doesn't matter what kind of conditions arise or whatever happens, as long as they're alive and breathing, they're going to do what they said they're going to do. One, one of the things Bev did the other day is so, uh, and, and this just shows you how uh, that kind of relationship can be with people. Uh, Bev was needing some, and Lawrence were needing some things moved uh, and picked up and so forth, some furniture and some things like that. And uh, we were talking about it, and we were talking about how it was going to happen and when we were going to do it and get it done. And so, and so Bev starts talking about giving some instructions about all these different things. And, uh, and I looked at her, and I said something I can't even remember. But from what I said, she, she got the point. She said, okay, you got it. You got it. All right, that's it. All right, I, you got it. No problem. It was like... It was like all of a sudden it dawned on, okay, we don't need to make any plans. We don't need to keep on going because you said that you're going to take care of it. So when you say you're going to take care of it, I let it go. That's right. I let it go. It doesn't matter how you're going to do it. It doesn't matter when you're going to do it. It's just going to get it done. Right. If I say it, it's going to be done. And that's what I'm talking about. And that's what people need in, in relationship with each other. And especially in these close relationships that we have, certainly with our mates, certainly with our children, because they're not ever going to forget those things, I guarantee you. And if you, you know, if they grow up with that, then the likelihood, the likelihood, not, not a guarantee, but the likelihood is that they're going to also be people of their word. Um, and, and that's what we're striving for. Integrity is just a, it's an inner character. It's a, it's a valuable inner character. Um, I always wanted to have good integrity. Right. And that's how I, I taught my children. Right. It's like you said at the beginning, your word is what's bond. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Your word is the bond. If you, if you can't do it, don't say it. Right. Yep. You say, well, I, I'll get back to you. It, it means something. If I say something to you, it's just like what you, you said to right. You said you was going to do it. I proved it. Right. It was. Your word is your body. <laughs> you was. said you going to do it. Right. That was so unusual. Now, I mean, seriously, it was, it's so unusual. But, of course, being around Beverly is, you know, you just get used to being on some things being unusual. But it was so unusual. <laughs> it was so, it was so. Remember, she's one of the bees here. Remember that. Oh, uh, yeah, right. But when she said that, it was so. It was so matter of fact. It was so frank. I'm I, I'm sitting there and I'm I'm hearing what she said and I'm thinking to myself, well, I hope I haven't offended her. You know, I hope I I hope I hadn't I hope I hadn't uh, made her think that you know I think she's butting in or something like that. you know how you you can read people and you're thinking oh man I hope I hope that I didn't wasn't too blunt about that or something you know and and all and kind of gave her the idea that I was being put off by what she was trying to suggest and that I was bothering me or anything like that. So, because it's so, it's so refreshing when somebody really trusts what you say, you know, it's like, uh, I said it, okay, it's done, let it go. Okay. We really, I mean, that's such an unusual thing nowadays because we have to have covenants and contracts and we have to have specifications and all these things about, all right, you do this and it's got to be done this way and it's got to be handled by this time. And I mean, we're just such a... A litigious society now where it almost seems like unless there's some legally binding something in life, everything's up in the air for discussion or disclosure or whether it's going to be done or not. And, and, and God says to us as his people, don't be like that. That's, that you, don't say things that you don't intend to do. And don't leave people with the impression that the words that are coming out of your mouth don't really mean anything. And um, because that's, that's a, a violation of, of trust and respect. And it, it leads to an undermining of relationship. It, it'd be just like, like me. All right, I'm your pastor. Um, you're here because God's led you here. And when I say things to you and I get up here and I, I'm, I'm speaking and I say, uh, we're going to do this or I believe the Lord wants us to do that or this is the direction I think the Lord's leading, leading us in and this is what I plan to do and I'm going to do and be responsible for this and so forth. I mean, you have to trust me. If, if, you, if you felt like, all right, if I said that to you and then I didn't do what I said and I did that 
over and over again, then you would learn not to trust me. Right. You would say, oh, pfft. well, he just jabbered, you know. Right, yeah, right, right. I mean, I couldn't really be your pastor because you couldn't trust me that what I'm saying to you that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do and be responsible for. And, uh, and so that's how important it is. And it's important in relationships. And I know I'm preaching to the choir because you guys, uh, of course, you several young ones here. But uh, <laughs> but uh, learn a lesson about this, all right? Just know that it really is important and that over a period of time, especially with people that you have a continuing relationship with, just know that that's something that is really important and it's vital. And the Lord says, you know, don't, don't let the words that come out of your mouth co- just come out and, 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 not, uh, and not consider what you're saying. And consider, you know, before you say it, think, am I going to do this? Or am I going to be, am I going to keep this? Or is this just something I'm saying to get somebody off my back? Or to try to pass it by? You know, we're in a little critical situation here, and I'm going to just say something, and that kind of gets, appeases everybody, but I don't really plan to do it, you know? Uh, Don't do that. Because uh, we're to be people of our word. We're to be people of our covenant. When we speak words, it makes a covenant. And covenants are very powerful in the scripture. Covenants are very important to God. I mean, our relationship with the Lord is a covenant that we have with him. And he keeps his covenant. And we keep our covenant. We're reflective of him. All right? Anybody, observations about that? Questions? Words? I'm glad that it's that, that we're on this. And I'm glad that, to know that it took me a while. You know, uh, you want that in life. And when you start off in life, you try to be that way. If you were taught that way, to be that way. One of the things right. that was very hard for me in the beginning of my life was when you're dealing with someone that's not like that. Right. And then you run into someone that is like that. And it has a tendency to make you not trust because of what you have gone through already right. with those that were not not like that. So it has, it has, it's been a road, a traveling road. And you're <laughs> talking to younger people now, I uh-huh. will over the air so they, they can hear this, but it right. also made me in the beginning feel, because of the way I was raised, every, all of us had integrity, so that's what I, I thought everyone else did, so it hurt. Right. And like, when you find out that a person that you're, that person is not, right. you know, and you might, you don't know whether to believe what they say or not, because mm-hmm. they're not. Right. And so, after I married this <laughs> <laughs> you know, it sort of makes you begin to wonder. So I'm glad the Lord has fixed it. So we, we that's how we're supposed to be. Right. Trying to say, right. In life. So yeah. that we can be trusted. Right. Well, I know, I, I can tell you one thing, guys, and I know this is probably not. Uh, any news to you if you've ever had any dealings with Lawrence, he'll tell you the truth now. There's just no doubt about it. Don't ask him if you don't want to know the truth. And I'm sorry if it hurts your feelings, but that's kind of the way it goes. I have over the years had a little influence on him, and we'll see the law of salt in a little while, and you'll kind of see what I'm talking about. But, um, you know, the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, the, if, you're, if you're not used to somebody that keeps their word, it's it's kind of hard. It's hard to you know to trust, and it, you have to build that relationship with them. But uh, the law of covenant says uh, good relationships come from people that that mean what they say and say what they mean, and will do what they say they'll do, and not try to excuse themselves out of it, and and you know have conditions that you don't know about, and all of that kind of stuff, loopholes in what they say, and all that kind of stuff. Which leads us right, really, naturally, to the next law. Law of seven is the law of truth. Um, this is really a vital thing. The truth is an endangered species nowadays. I'm going to tell you that. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the things that I'm seeing today, nowadays, is it's really hard to look at society and know what is really true and, and, what's, and what is somebody else's perspective of truth. It's just ridiculous. It, you know, I don't, uh, you older people that with me, um, we, you know, we didn't have, it just seemed like we didn't have voices of authority that spoke to us that 
were so completely opposite of each other that you wondered, what is the truth here? I mean, we had Walter Cronkite and people like that, you know. Now, they might have been deceiving us. I don't know because I don't know every detail about everything that they were saying. But I do know that we, we, when we watched that, we had, to, we had a trust to that. I mean, we, when we saw it, you know, Walter Cronkite ended every broadcast. And I'm not, I'm not deifying Walter Cronkite, all right. I'm just saying that this is a different generation today. But he ended every broadcast by saying, and that's the way it is, you know. <laughs> And then he would give the date, and that's the way it is. And uh, and, uh, and I can remember, you know, uh, watching him on specials because, uh, of course, I was more of a child when he was really kicking and alive. But I can remember uh, with the moonshot, with Kennedy assassination, big events like that, that. I mean, he'd pull off those old black rim glasses and wipe a tear, you know, when President Kennedy was shot. And it was such a terrible emotional moment for the nation and everything and uh, and you would watch that and and you just had a sense that they were telling you the truth about things and so you had a certain amount of trust in in what was being said but but our society now is it, i mean truth like i said is a is a is an endangered species uh, yeah, yeah yeah fake fake news fake everything and and it's just such a it's hard uh, and see and see what it what it does is it creates a, an unstable environment for the people that are under your authority or that are in your sphere of influence around life because it 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 seems that we are being taught to be deceitful but things like and, and you know and and I don't care what politics you are but. Things like it, it seemed to begin really uh, in earnest when the uh, the president of the United States got on TV and was being uh, uh, being questioned, you know, by an investigative committee for impeachment, and he was straining at the word "is." You know, well, it depends on what "is" is. You know, that kind of thing. And it was like, I'm serious. It was like. You're trying to explain away what is. When you said this is, well, now it's not really what is. It's really a shade of what is. And, it, and I mean, that's just an example. And so I'm not trying to pick on some single person, but that's just an example of what I'm talking about. That it seems like everything is said by people with a, with a loophole in it, with a, with a clause that's hidden and you have to and, and you have to examine every word because they have they choose their words carefully so that whatever word they use could be used to escape what they just said if they need to and what does that do to us look at our look at us look at our society look at what's happened with the stability of our country the stability of our people and families and and, and all of the uh, institutions of life. I mean, they're all rocking and reeling and shaking, and people feel like, you know, that, that you know, the, the pillars of our relationship have been built on a lie. You, you can't have that in your family. You can't have that in your life. You can't have that with your children and the people that you love and respect and want to have influence because what it does is it, uh, it kills intimacy. You know, in other words, for us to be intimate, and remember, when I, I feel responsible when I say this word, to, to go, yeah, to go into it a little bit, because every time I say that word, I'm seeing people think I'm talking about sex. <laughs> because that word intimate is associated with sex because of the way it's advertised and the way it's talked about and, you know, and the intimate apparel industry and blah, 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 you know. Uh, the word intimacy really doesn't have anything to do with sexuality. It's just a word that is used in connection with sexuality because it is, uh, it, it, it builds a relationship that can be sexual because intimacy means in to me see, if you want to kind of define it that way. If I'm going to be intimate with someone, it means I have allowed them to see into me. 
So I have opened myself so that they can see my character, see my dreams, see my purpose, see what's valuable to me, see what's important to me. And if I'm going to be intimate with someone, it, my, my relationship with them has to be built on the truth. Because if I find out that they're being deceptive, now the relationship crumbles because it's all been built on a lie. Because I can't be intimate with someone if I'm not going to be truthful with them. Because I can't believe what they say. I can't believe that they're representing that. I mean, they may be building some fantasy person I wouldn't even know. And they're deceiving me. So uh, the scripture says... Well, Ephesians 4, the scripture that's on the top of your page says, Let every man put away lying. Let every one of you speak the truth to his neighbor, for we are members one of another. I mean, that's just as clear as it can be when we deal with each other. Speak the truth. Because that's what your relationships are built on. And and I've got a little definition. Yeah, Bill, what you got? Uh, talking about truth, just certain not to have any other. Well, I have a grandson. Mm-hmm. He's had far surgeries on that. They have, they grew up kind of like that. Right. After school, of course, but in the Bible, not too long before we got ready to move down here, I asked him one day, I said, Ethan, if somebody asks you what are two things that your papa taught you, what would you tell them? Mm-hmm. He said, well, I'd tell them, I mean, he just started out, he said, I'd tell them that Jesus always loved them. That's two really good things. That is exactly right. That Jesus loves me and don't lie. And, right. And see, that's, that's really, that, that's, that's important. That's very important because of your relationship. Yeah, it's amazing how some people just, they, could, they lie when it's easier to tell the truth. They have their own agenda. Yeah. And you want, and the thing that you ask yourself sometimes, like I think Miss Jackie said, that you wonder why someone would lie knowing that you're going to know the truth. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not like, okay, I'm going to be able to deceive this person and they'll never know. Uh, it's sitting right in front of you. And uh, it's, it's it, and they would when it's easier to tell the truth. I mean, you know, you, you go out of your way to deceive, because what it, what is what is to lie? I mean, to lie means uh, I think I gave you a, a definition um, at the, in the first little uh, sub point under Law Seven. It says, "Tell the truth. A lie is an intent to deceive." So. <laughs> You don't even have to speak to tell a lie, right? If somebody's speaking something to you and you know the truth and you don't correct that, then you have allowed something to go by you with an in, because you have an intent to deceive them. So if they say something to you and it's wrong and you don't correct it, then that's a form of lying. And I, I mean, I'm not trying to strain at a gnat up here and swallow a camel. I'm just saying to you that, that, that you don't have to speak something to somebody to, to deceive them. You can allow them to think something. And you know they're thinking something. And you just let it pass and don't try to correct it and make it clear. And, you know, uh, I know we've had times in our lives when something has come across our path and we know that that person is not thinking right. 
And we know that they're thinking one thing, and we said it, and they thought that, and it's not right, but we didn't. We just let it pass because it's not worth arguing about, or we say, whew, well, I'm glad we're past that, but, but we just let it go. And, uh, and that's a form of being dishonest right there. That's a form of, of lying. Yeah, it, it'll 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 circle back around, and and then when it, and a lot of times it's worse. Yeah, right, right, right. You just take care of it up front. Right, and it you know the thing that that I've learned is it's much easier just to go ahead and deal with it at the time, rather than to let it circle around. Get it'll increase itself. It'll just add to the confusion and add to the. Uh, the the issues. It's just going to create some more issues for you if you don't straighten it out right then. And the scripture says to speak the truth. And so tell the truth. So you've got the law of the covenant, which means don't don't say stuff you don't intend to, to do. When you make a promise, keep it. When you make a when you say something that you're going to do or not do or whatever, keep it. And do what you say you're going to do. I, I give you one little simple example that just gets violated about that law of covenant. It just flash back to me all the time. Uh, people who correct their children with words of covenant and they don't keep them. Like if you do that again, I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to punish you. And then the child does it, and they don't punish them. Uh, that's a covenant. A covenant when you say, if, if you do this, then I'm going to do this. That's covenant language. And you need to do it. And because if you don't, man, you're creating, you're creating uh, issues for everybody. Uh, because children walk away and they think, okay, my they teacher's die, like, yeah. yeah, right. It, it, and here's, here's another thing I've learned in case all of us uh, who, who are sitting here who are grandparents and great-grandparents don't already know this. All you young ones, listen to, to this right here. When, you tell, when, in, when it comes to discipline and your children, uh, you, create, you create what you want to live with. In other words, if you have certain standards and you say, okay, my child's not going to do this, and then they do this, and then you say to them, stop, and they keep on, and then you say to them, I told you to stop doing that, and then they keep on, and then you say, I'm not going to tell you again, stop, and then you say to them the fourth time, uh, this is it, I'm not talking anymore, and they keep on doing it. What you've just done is you've taught them that you're going to say this to them three or four times before you actually enforce whatever it is that you told them to do. If you want to create that kind of an environment, then that's how you do it. If you want them to respond to the first thing you say, then you respond to the first thing you say. If you say, you're just torturing yourself. You're, you're teaching them that it's okay to keep on doing it when I just said stop doing it because I don't really mean what I'm saying. I'm going to say it another three or four times before I actually get to, you know, enforcing what I just said. So you create your own environment. If you want to be tortured like that, hey, go for it, because that's exactly the way you do it. If you want them to respond the first time, as soon as they violate whatever you said the first time, put the hammer on them. I mean, take care of it, buddy. Because... <laughs> yeah, right. Hey, take it easy on yourself. Don't worry. Yeah, <laughs> this is gonna hurt me more than it hurts you. Shoot, man. I used to think that. I used to say, "Mom, take it easy." You know, I mean, take it. Of course, I wouldn't dare say anything like that because it would be like, "Ooh, my goodness, man." Oh, my parents never missed a lick. I'm telling you, they weren't Christians uh, in my growing up years, but. Uh, they were certainly uh, people of their of their commitment. I can tell you that they never missed a lick. I, <clears throat> I never got a whipping that I didn't deserve, but I did. I did slide on a few of them they didn't know anything about. But uh, they're with the Lord now, so I I can talk about it. You know. So anyway, uh, yeah, I had to be careful. Yeah, I had to be careful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm learning things about my children right now. I wish I didn't even know. You know. I mean, of course, they're 38 and 38 and 36, you know, so it's a little late. I mean, the expiration date is kind of gone, come and gone, but uh, I'm thinking to myself, oh, my goodness, you, did, you know. 
So, all right, the law of covenant and law of truth, uh, these are things we do with our mouth. And these are laws that God says are important to us to remember about our mouth. And the scripture teaches us. All right, law number eight. Law number eight is the law of the trumpet. Now, this one might be a little bit, of course, because uh, I blow a shofar in every service. It's easy for us to know what a trumpet, what the trumpet is and what it was used for in the Bible and what it means when it talks about it in the Bible. The word trumpet in the Bible is a translation of the Hebrew word shofar. So that right there is a shofar. And when you see the word trumpet in the Bible, that's what it's talking about. And what the shofar was used for, it was used to communicate to the nation of Israel. God uh, used that through Moses or through Joshua or through the priest in the temple. Remember in the temple that uh, at one time there were uh, seven priests and seven trumpets and they blew seven blasts on the trumpets and it meant and signified certain things and certain certain patterns ago. So the reason it, was ha it had to be used is because imagine if you are out in the desert like Moses is in the desert and he's leading a million people or some historians think there were, might have been as many as two million people that were led out of Egypt and led out into the desert and you have no speaker systems and you have no communication systems and so forth, how are you going to communicate to a million people or two million people all at the same time because you have to go forward sometimes, you have to stop sometimes, you have to encamp and circle up sometimes. Imagine how difficult it would be to communicate with that many people without any ability. I mean, out in the wide open spaces of a desert, without some way to communicate. So they use the trumpet. They use the shofar. And just like I blow it on every Sunday morning and I do, you know, two short blasts and then eight, you know, quick bursts, there are all kinds of different signals that were used to signify certain things. And when they would hear it, it, it would tell, it would communicate with them what they need to know. And so the, the trumpet sound had to be, uh, had to be loud. It had to be distinct it couldn't be you know when when it came time for circle up guys were under attack it couldn't be a you know i mean it had, I mean, it had to be confident and it had bop, 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 you know and so it had to be clean it had to be certain it had to be confident it had to be you know something that really communicated uh with the people and so in first corinthians 14 the scripture says if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound who will prepare to go for battle? And so the scripture is saying there that if the trumpet is not distinct, if the trumpet is not confident, if the trumpet is withholding itself, if it fails to communicate clearly, then the people aren't going to know what to do. Now, in the family, Dad, you're the trumpet. I mean, this is really a word, I, and I'm not saying that, that you ladies don't have some responsibility to be the, a trumpet in, in a lot of categories, but just because we would talk about family, because we know about families and so forth, uh, this would be a word to the leader of the family, the one who God holds responsible to the family, and he would say, listen, you're the trumpet, and in the family... If you're not clear, if you're not distinct, if you're not decisive, uh, the family's not going to know what to do. The family's going to be leaderless. And, and so uh, you need to understand that it's your responsibility to, uh, to, to work hard at the fact that your family would know what you want to communicate with them and you want them to do in response to what you're doing. And this is difficult for men a lot of times because remember, uh, men and women are, are different in the way we communicate, right? Uh, men are big headliners and, and you can tell because when you when the guys come home from work or whatever it might be and you say, how did it go? Then what are they gonna do? Uh, fine. All right, headline, uh, how'd it go? Fine. 
women are not headliners. Women want the details, right? They, they, men are the headlines and women are the, okay, the article here. They want information. They want more. You know, like the dad comes home and says, uh, 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 hey, uh, Harry told me today they're getting a divorce. And, and then the wife would say, the natural response would be, what would the wife ask? Well, Why? And the man would say, well, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. I don't know. I don't know. Right. That's exactly that. See, that's the point. That is the point right there. Men would say, uh, hey, well, by the way, Harry's getting a divorce. And then she's going to say, well, why? And then, and then he'd say, oh, I don't know. And what would be the next response? Well, why don't you know? I mean, how in the world could somebody say something like that to you and you not ask any questions about it and find out what's going on? And then the men would respond with something like, well, uh, he, didn't ask me, he didn't ask me any questions. Like, if he had asked me, what do you think about that? Or what do you think I ought to do? Then I would have given him some response. But, you know, he didn't say anything. He just told me what he was going to, what was going to happen. And so I said, okay, yeah, man, you know, you're getting a divorce. I'm, I'm sorry for that or whatever your little response might, might've been. And see, men are real simple like that. Men think like that. Men, you know, we don't dig in and, and, and get to the article. A lot of times we we're kind of surface level, big headline kind of things. And, and, and that's why I'm saying to you that the law of the trumpet means that men we need to be uh, more informative to the, the people that we lead in life because they need some clear, distinct directions from us to know what we really feel that the Lord is leading us in life. I know a, a, one of the most common complaints that wives have of their husbands is, he never talks to me about things and it's the truth because uh, we we just we don't feel compelled to open up our inner self and give more directions I, I, I know a lot of times guys say man all my wife does just ask questions and they just and, and and they feel frustrated by that because it seems like that she is asking all these questions because she doesn't trust the direction or she doesn't trust what we're doing or where we're going or all of that kind of stuff. But the, guys, the reason she asks so many questions is because you don't ever tell her anything. If you would tell her stuff, she wouldn't have to ask questions about this. In other words, when you say, Hey, uh, let's, uh, let's go out to eat Friday night. This is just a little simple thought. You know, let's go out to eat Friday night. What's, what is, what is your wife going to say? Okay. What time? Well, I don't you know, look, it's seven o'clock or so. All right, well, where are we going? Why would she ask that? Because you didn't tell her where you were going, and it matters whether you're going to McDonald's or down to, you know, some fancy restaurant, because it's, it matters what she's going to wear. But, you, you know, you didn't say anything about that, so her question has to be, well, where are we going? Uh, and then the next question might be, uh, what are we going to do with the kids? Because, you, you know, you have two or three there, and you can't just leave them at home alone, so somebody's going to have to take... Because you didn't say anything about, okay, we're going at 7. That I had to ask you about that because you didn't say, hey, we're going out Friday night. About Let's go out at 7 o'clock. Um, we're going to go down to uh, the reef, and, uh, and, and, and Granny's going to keep the kids. All right? Now she doesn't have to ask any questions because you clearly communicated what it is, where it is, what. And then here's another question that a lot of younger people do, especially because money and resources can be an issue about this kind of thing. Uh, you know, or can we afford this? You know, hey, so I'm clear in communicating and I say, hey, I got a raise today. I'm going to be making, I'm going to be making $50 a week more than I used to make. So let's go out and celebrate. We'll go down to the reef at 7 o'clock Friday night, and Granny's going to keep the kids. Now you have clearly and distinctly communicated the sound of the trumpet. Remember that said, if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, 
how will the people know what to do? So if the trumpet dad, which is you, the leader of the family, the distinguisher of direction and so forth for the responsibility of the people that are under your leadership, if you don't make distinct sounds, how are they going to know what to do? So if when it comes time for battle, you go, yeah. <laughs> then they, they are going to say, what, 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 what is that? What do we, you know, do we need to circle up or run, you know, <laughs> go right or go left? What, I mean, all of a sudden it creates this, it creates all of this confusion among those. And, and so the, the encouragement is Dad, if you, will, if you will recognize your tendency to be vague then and start being responsible to be distinct, you can help everybody under your leadership know exactly what you feel. Now, I mean, because, look, if God's going to hold you responsible for the leadership of your family, and it's just good it's just good leadership qualities, whether you're talking to other men or your family or, or you're a leader at work or you have responsibility over anybody that's under your direction. Anybody that uh, it's just good information to you that God says t you're the trumpet. And so I expect the trumpet to give clear broadcast and clear information so that everybody under the leadership knows exactly what to do. And I'm holding you responsible because if you feel like that God has given you a direction or God has given you a word or God has given you something that you need to communicate to the family or this is what we need to do, where we need to go, or what we need to be about, whether it's about going out to eat on Friday night or whether it's what we're going to do with our family, where we're going to go to church and all of that kind of stuff. God holds us responsible, and so we need to, uh, to give a clear and decisive sound so that everybody under our leadership will know exactly what we want to communicate as an instruction from the Lord or instruction about our life. And if we do this, then the people don't have to ask a bunch of questions and don't have to try to feel like, okay, are we going there? Do we, does he know what's going on? Is he thought about this and stuff like that? Because one of the things about women is one of the major emotional needs of the life of women is the need for security. And why do they ask so many questions, guys? Because the answers to those questions make them feel secure. As the back to our eating and Friday night and so forth, uh, if you say, let's go out to eat, and then they say, well, what time are we going so I'll know when to get ready, and you haven't told them that, well, that creates a little insecurity. It's like, okay, when are we going? Do I need to be ready when you get home, or are we going to go at 7 o'clock, or what do I need to do? We need to start getting the kids ready, get them ready for whatever's going to happen to them. Do we have enough money? I mean, all these kind of questions begin to go on because there's been no clear there's been no clear trumpet blast about that. So now that's an insecurity. Well, uh, what do I need to wear? Do I need to plan to, you know, do I need to iron my dress or plan to dress up? And do I need to put on blue jeans or whatever? So there's a little, a little question about that. So now there's a little insecurity. Uh, all right, how are we going to afford it? Well, there's a little bit more insecurity. Can we, can we really do this? It's going to cost us about a hundred bucks to go to a place like that. Do we really have, <laughs> do we really have that much money? Can we afford to do that on our budget and so forth? And I mean, that's just a small example, but that's, that's what what this law is about. It's about being responsible to lead the people in a clear and distinct and decisive manner so that, that you don't leave them with insecurities and you don't leave them with a sense that you don't have a clear leadership in your life, in your direction. I mean, you, you, you guys, you know, know Pastor Tanya and you know you see her life and you see her ability to administrate and all that. Uh, do you think that if I, being a trumpet in our family, if I didn't lead in a decisive, clear way, that she would be um, submissive to that kind of uh, backward and awkward leadership in life? No, wouldn't do it. Ain't no way. 
So what would end up, it would end up with the tail wagging the dog and, and trying to lead through the back door and try to lead behind and see that's what creates the, this instability and unstable life and unstable families. And then the children pick up on that. And so then they begin to go to mom because mom's really the leader leading through the back door because dad can't make a decision and he's indecisive about whatever he says and whatever he talks about. And so it creates an undermining uh, leadership hierarchy in life and families begin to disintegrate because uh, the leader is really not the leader because the leader fails to communicate a clear, distinct, direct, positive, uh, decisive leadership in the family. So the law of the trumpet is, hey, be responsible, be, uh, be decisive, uh, be, make, you, make yourself communicate, even if it's not a natural thing for you. Uh, learn how to... Uh, Learn how to, how to fill in the details. Learn how to... Learn that, that the people that you lead have, might have lots of questions. And so don't be defensive about what the directions are and feel like because somebody asks about something that they're, they don't believe in you. It may have everything to do with, hey, the reason they're asking you is because you don't talk to them. If you had have told them that, then they wouldn't be asking a bunch of questions. If I walk in and I said, hey, we're going down to the reef on Friday night at 7 o'clock, got your mama to keep the kids, and we got a raise this week. Praise the Lord. And she'll say, hot dog, let's go. There's no questions now because I've answered all of them. And, uh, and that's the law of the trumpet. And it'll, it'll make things better. So no matter if you're dealing with your maid or you're dealing with the people you work for or work under, work over, uh, people in a, uh, a Bible study group, people in a prayer ministry or whatever it might be, uh, it makes life better when you're decisive if you're the leader of that thing. All right? Y'all got any um, observations about that? Or is there anything that, that, uh, that, you, that you answered? I see one thing on the bottom of page 21. Did any of you do that? Let's take this practice run with this one. Choose one of the following topics. Use the space below to communicate your thoughts concerning the subject in three sentences or less and prepare to share it with the class. My commitment to the School of Leaders and why I think it's important. Did anybody answer any of that? Did y'all do your homework? Didn't have it. Did anybody else? So y'all all didn't do your homework. We're going to have to have a we'll have to have a ten. I smacked this week. <laughs> I ain't going to lie about it. I hear you. <laughs> Tell the truth, brother. Tell the truth. <laughs> well, at least we know now. Yeah, there's that. All right, let's get to the law of salt. The law of salt. Um, your speech should be with grace, seasoned with salt. That's what Colossians 4, 6 says. Salt is a seasoning. Right? Now, I mean, you know, the, the scripture a lot of times is just so practical, what it says to us. Your word, your speech should be with grace. All right, so that means that we should do our very best as God's people to speak gracefully to each other. In other words, to, to, to recognize that. You don't have to be a bull in a china shop. That people that respond to you, that, that listen to what you say, that you have some sense of, uh, of authority or you have a place of, of, of authority in somebody's life and you have a lot of influence in others' lives, be, when you talk to them, be as graceful as you can. You don't have to blast everybody and blow somebody out of the water and kill them and crush them in order to speak to them with the truth. You know, one of the things I think, one of the hardest scriptures to live out in life practically is to speak the truth with love. That's a really difficult thing to do a lot of times, right? And you have to plan what you're going to say. You have to think about what you're going to say so that whatever it is you're saying comes across with a loving spirit. Because you can say, listen, you can say anything to anybody if you say it in the right way. And what this scripture is saying is, look, just like salt is a, is a seasoning that when you sprinkle a little salt on stuff, 
It makes it taste better. Have any of you, I know some of you have trained yourself not to use salt because it raises your blood pressure or something like that. But now the rest of us normal people, <laughs> it, if, if I'm eating something and it doesn't have any salt on it, I mean, I am guarantee you, I went to London. I went through London. Uh, this was probably 15 years ago. In the, early, in the early 90s, I went over, no, in the late 80s, so that's been longer. I went over to India to do some mission work, and I was over there for like 17, 18 days teaching in a seminary in India, and we were doing some work in India. And we had to fly through London. And, of course, in London, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but London has a really good racket going on. And the racket is they have two airports. One is Heathrow, uh, and the other is, help me if, if you've ever been there, it doesn't really matter the name of it. I'll think of it in a few minutes when I'm not trying. But these airports are about 15 miles apart. So you might be landing at one, and then you have to get your next flight is at the other one. Your departure's at the other one. So you have an, an hour, let's say, or an hour and a half to get, a, get off the plane here, get a taxi, get in, get your baggage and all that stuff, and then get 15 miles to the next airport so that you can get on the plane that's going to the, your destination or vice versa. So what a racket that is because, believe me, it cost about $100 to get that taxi from right there to right there. So that's an amazing little scam they got going on, in my opinion. But, but anyway, so I was in, in London, and uh, one on the way back home, we, we stayed overnight. Because when you get to England, you're about halfway between here and India. So you're going to, you know, it's going to be like six or seven hours. Well, it's one in going over... It's, uh, it's about five hours, roughly, because the jet stream is pushing you. When you come back, you're flying against the jet stream, so it takes about seven hours because the jet stream is pushing against the plane and it can't go as fast and so forth. So, you, you know, you got to judge. Yeah, you got to ju Yeah, go around all the way around the whole world. But anyway, the point being that I had to stay in London overnight, and I'm going to tell you this is an experience. Uh, in London, you have these little pubs and these little taverns and these little uh, places to eat. It's uh, like a little, a lot of places are just a little pub looking kind of things, just like you'd think that, uh, that they might be. And they serve uh, meals. And I'm going to tell you something. Uh, I ordered some kind of general meal there. And when they brought it out, it had like English peas on the tray. And man, those things were beautiful. They were really deep green. <laughs> Lies looking, had a little carrots, and you know, I mean, it, 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 it looked so good. And my taste buds and my mouth and said, hot dog, boy, it's got me like some little pork chop and little beans like that and little potatoes. And so I scooped in there and got me a big old mouthful of English peas and, and a carrot, you know, and say, oh, yeah. And when I put them in my mouth, my mouth went, Bleh! get them out of here. <laughs> Because they looked beautiful, but they didn't have any salt on them. It was horrible. It was like, these are marbles I'm putting in my mouth. And now, and then I knew why Churchill had to cross the English Channel. Because he had to go over there to get something good to eat, you know, is what he was after. But I'm, I'm just saying that just like that is, is, a, is a really... Um, little clear, little crazy picture of what the words that we speak, it's important that when we say something that we might sprinkle a little salt on it so it's more palatable, so that others, when they receive these words, um, it's, it's less offensive, it's more tasteful, it's more received because we, we sprinkled a little salt. So the law of salt says you can say almost anything if you... If you season it right, yes. Yeah, that's and see, that's exactly what this law is about. Is you you need you need to communicate. You need to say something that might not be real palatable, but you need to sprinkle a little salt on it before you put it on somebody's plate. You know, and 
think about what you're saying and think about how you say what you say because you may be speaking the truth and you may be giving them directions that they really need, but you need to be gracious about it and you need to understand how this might be uh, received by someone else because they may not have the, the concept that you have when you're saying it. They, they, they may not have that insight. And so when you say it, how they receive it is going to be really important. So be careful how you say it. In other words, think about what you're going to say. Think about how that's going to be received by someone. I think one of the, the, the most careful things we can do, and if you could get people to do this, it would just greatly enhance communication and what we do with our mouth. And that is, if we would think about someone else's perspective before we say things to them and try to give them direction and change their life, if we would just think, okay, how is what I'm going to say, how is that going to be received? If somebody said that to me, how would I respond to that? And are they going to respond to what I say with the same thought pattern that I have in life? The old saying is, walk a mile in somebody else's shoes before you criticize them. Well, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying before you talk and say something that is hard or is might be um, received in a negative way or a, or a way that's not productive, I mean, why, why do you want to say something to somebody? Because you want to help them, because you want it to matter, to be, to be directive, to be incisive. You, you know, you're, you're wanting to speak this because you sense that when you say this, that this is going to help their life be better or help them know what to do or not to do. So you've got to be careful how you say it and realize that if you will say it in the right way before these words come out, sprinkle a little salt on the words so that when they hear it, uh, it's, it's more tasty, it's, more, it's better received, because why are you saying it? Because you want it to be received. Because, not because you want to say something to hurt somebody or to, to, to punish them by what you say with the words out of your mouth. You're saying this because your intent is to, is to help. So uh, be, be tactful, you know, be, be gracious about it. Be, be, be gentle uh, in the way you say it because I, I know... My role as a grandparent in the family, now this might sound a little weird, but you, I think you'll, you guys will know what I'm saying because you're all like me, uh, except for you young ones. But my, you know, my, my role in the, in, the, in the family is I'm like Papa Bear. You know, I'm kind of gruff. I'm kind of, oh, boy, get those grandkids out of here. Boy, just shut the door. What's wrong with you? You know, I mean, my general role is to be a little gruff, to be a little, a little testy. You know, that's my kind of role I play in the family. Uh, you know, don't make Papa, you know, have to get on to you kind of deal, you know. And I play my part, really, you know. And so my part is to be a little growly, a little, little rough, a little, you know, uh, yeah, you shut that door. What's wrong with you, boy? You know, kind of, kind of stuff like that. And so everybody, you don't need to be Papa Bear all the time, you know, is what it's saying, or Mama War Eagle, you know. Nobody likes living with a, e a War Eagle, and nobody likes living with a Papa Bear all the time. Every once in a while, you know, be gracious, be gentle, you know, be, you know, be careful and sprinkle a little salt because I guarantee you that if you say it right, if you say what you're going to say, no matter how negative or how harmful it, it can be, if you'll be careful and gracious and sprinkle some salt before you say it, it can be received by someone that you want to receive it in a way that will be effective and be productive. So the law of salt says, hey, think about that. Be gentle. Your speech should be with grace and seasoned by salt. All right. Any, any observations about that? Any, any uh, request for prayer? <laughs> any word? Mm -hmm. How many of you have found this to be true? Do you practice this? Yeah. 
Bev, I'm telling you, you are one of the most, uh, you are one of the star students on this little point right here. I guarantee you. Bev, uh, being from Chicago and rearing five uh, kids and being, you know, having boys and being by yourself a lot and having to be the leader of your family by yourself, having to make it through a rough environment. Belle was the Papa Bears of Papa Bears. I'm telling you, she was really, and she fell into that because that's the way she, you'd had to be all of your life to be effective and so forth. But now, you know, coming down here and then of course being married to Lawrence now, uh, life had changed and she didn't really need to be that way anymore. But it was hard to break out of that character, wasn't it? Because that's the way you had been trained all your life is to be that way. And so it was easy to hurt people. It was easy to not be received real well because you didn't really think about that. And you just responded in ways that you had been conditioned all your life. But when you begin to think about it, now uh, everybody loves Bev. And it's like, hey, you know, she's, she says things in much more salty ways. <laughs> And not much better received, much better. And and so the leadership is far better because of sprinkling a little salt on it and thinking, hey, wait a minute, I don't need to say that like that. I need to be more gentle about that. I need to come through the back door instead of knocking the front door down. Uh, because it's it, it because what are you trying to do? You're trying to be effective as a leader. You're not, you know, and if you want to be effective, you have to learn how to communicate with people so things can be received rather than you bombing them and they run off crying because, you know, you just killed them with what you said. Think of another way to say it, you know. Think of a way that can be salt, a little, little you know, sprinkle a little salt on that thing. All right. That came from, that came from years of your class. <laughs> that came from when we, we started, you started teaching us yeah. right Yeah, and you're right about it. We did. Uh -huh. and, and we've had them ever since, you know, about every year or so. Somebody. Right. And so after, after listening to this and, and reading with this and, and allowing the Lord to work with you, work with me, that that happened. But right. Leading it, it's just like you said. Coming down here, I was not like that. Mm -mm. You were the mama bear. Yeah. I mean, you were. You were. I had no well, that's right. And if you and if you acted that way, then you would be taken advantage of. People yeah. would run over yeah. you and four boys and one girl. Right. I have time with these sweet what I had to say to them. That's right. My daughter even told me, she said, Mama, when you talk to me, could you not holler? <laughs> right. And I told her, I said, I ain't got no time to be changing my voice when I talk to you. <laughs> yeah. You can't handle it getting this going. That's too bad. You know <laughs> Say that? See, you now there was no salt on that at all. <laughs> yeah. You know the girl that's four boys. I'm going to change my voice. Four big old boys. Yeah, I told her that. And, she's the best yeah. and see, you know, the thing, think about it. You're in Chicago in that kind of an environment, in that kind of a city, in that kind of a place with all these people that had their own agendas and all of that, and you're rearing four boys yeah. in that kind of an environment and a daughter, and you're, right, you're by yourself. <laughs> And so you have to be the disciplinarian. You have to be the lover of them. You have to be the trainer, the disciplinarian, the teacher. You have to be all of that. And so see how easy it would be to develop a pattern yeah. of communicating and a pattern of a rough exterior so that people won't take advantage of you yeah. and you can get yourself across. But then when you move to another environment that is more gentle, that has more filters in it, because, you know, we in the South, we have lots of little filters that, you know, in, in our in our lives with each other, and we're generally more gentle about things. Uh, you have to learn how to live in that environment in a way that will be productive with what you say to people, and you don't need to come across as this, you know, hard, rough, exterior, uh, growling kind of a person that you can be far more, far better received if if you'll just learn to sprinkle a little salt and kind of say it in a more gentle, graceful way. And, uh, you work. Work yeah, you do. It takes some time, he doesn't is, it? He is in that process of it. Because, it, I mean, I could read this day and night. <laughs> and, 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 and it's like, you know, when I came in and I said, hey, I'm going to change my voice. Yeah. Right. Because I'm going to change my voice. Yeah. Because I'm going to change my voice. Yeah. 
this. Right. And to see it working. Yeah. You know, it didn't work on you. Right. So it, it, it has to, it's, it's a, it's a yeah. you have to render yourself to the Lord. Right. And allow him to work with you. Yeah. And see, that, that's because you were open to that. Because that's what you really wanted in yeah. life. Yeah. You really did want to change. You didn't want to be um, not well received and not well understood. And um, you wanted to be part of something that could be positive rather than negative. That God sent you here to be of help. Not to yeah. stir up yeah. trouble. Not to make it where I have to try to pick up people who have been run over by your feelings or your words or you something like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, y'all, I did. I I took Beverly out of uh, three groups of people. Yeah, I said, I said, don't go anymore. And she didn't even quit coming to church. She just said, okay, Pastor. Of what she said, and she did it. And then we went to something else, and then there she was in there again, messing up stuff and hurting people or whatever. So you get out of get. All right, come on. Don't want you in that group anymore. You got to come out. You know, <laughs> she would do it. One of the few people I've ever had in life that really I could do that to, and she and she did. It didn't matter. She just kept right on coming. She said, "Yes, sir, I'll do it." And then, boom, that was it. And then, whatever, what you want me to do now? And so, yeah. Uh huh. Got a little salt on it. Got a little sprinkle, a little salt on it. And uh, but 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 it was because there was a real desire in Beverly to uh, to be a person that could be helpful. I mean, she didn't want to cause more problems and make more work for me and, and hurt other people. She wanted to be helpful and wanted to be useful and help me rather than hurt me. To, and I said, well, you're going to have to learn how to be gentle. You're going to have to learn how to be sweet mama of the church, not mean mama bear. <laughs> and so we're going to have to train you not to be mean mama bear because that's what you, that's that, I mean, think about it. That's kind of, if that's in you, that you just kind of naturally fall back on that because that's your default. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you realize that's not what you need to be, what you, what I need for you to be is like sweet mama of the church where if somebody's, need some correction that they can come to Mama and be loved and be gently led to something, not run over and mashed by a steamroller on its way <laughs> growling out the door, you know. And so that's what has happened. And so now, you know, the kids run down and hug her neck and kiss her and say, good morning, Miss Bev, or something like that, rather than running away and trying to hide because they, they know she's going to bite them if they get close enough to her, you know? So anyway, there's, that's the law of salt. All right, one more, one more thing, and, uh, and we'll be through with the law of your mouth. Uh, the law of apology. Law number 10, the law of apology. Uh, Hosea 14, scripture that's here says, take words, listen, take words with you. And return to the Lord. Say to him, take away all iniquity. Receive us graciously, for we will offer the sacrifices of our lips. Um, these scripture, this scripture is saying that, that words can change an offense. That, that words can restore your relationships. That, that words can bring healing. Uh, an apology is when you go to someone that you have offended and you speak words to them. You carry words. This says, go to the Lord and carry words. So it's telling us that words can change Offenses, words can change violations of things into people. In other words, when we offend someone, what we have done is we have damaged our relationship with them. Now, because we have damaged our relationship with them, there are certain consequences of that. Like if I damage my relationship with my wife, let's just say, maybe she won't speak to me that night. Well, not speaking to me is a consequence of the fact that I have damaged the relationship. 
or I, she locks me out of the house. <laughs> that is a consequence. That, 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 in other words, I have violated the relationship. I have damaged the relationship. I have hurt what I've said or what I've done has violated, has hurt the relationship, has damaged the feeling, the, 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 the flow of, of our relationship. And because of that, there are consequences. Well, the consequences are she locks me out of the house or she won't speak to me or I'm sleeping on the couch or I'm in the doghouse or, you know, whatever consequence it might be. So the law of apology says take words with you. In other words, your words are going to be the healers of, of this breach in relationship. But you need to understand that an apology is, is, is not used in order to, and I know this is a, a, one of those distinctions that you may say, well, that, I, don't, I don't know if that's distinguishable, but think about it this way. When you apologize to someone, the motive of your apology is important. Why are you apologizing? Because if you're apologizing simply to escape the consequences, in other words, you don't want to be locked out of the house, so that's why you apologize. You don't want to be sleeping in the doghouse, so that's why you apologize. You don't want to be um, silenced out with a cold shoulder, so you want to apologize. Then that's not, that's not apology. That's remorse. You know, you're sorry that you did what you did because it causes her not to speak to you. So, you, you know, you're going to apologize because you're trying to escape the consequence. That, that's not, a, that, that's not a, what you need to apologize for. What you need to apologize is that you have violated the relationship. I've come to you to apologize to you because I hurt you. And I know that what I did damaged the relationship. So please forgive me for hurting our relationship. I'm sorry. I was only thinking of myself. I, I love you. I, I don't want us to, I don't want to damage you or hurt you. So please forgive me because I realize that what I did has violated our relationship and our covenant with each other. That's an apology. So whether they will receive that or not from you, when you say this, it's in the ball's in their court. And you can't make them accept the apology, but what you've done is scripturally, you have apologized and you've done what you need to in order for this relationship to be healed and to be mended. And, and the responsibility now is, 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 is over for you and so that means that when you go to someone, you, your idea is not, okay, I'm sorry I did this because I, you know, I see that it hurts you and it's, you're locked me out of the house. Well, that's not an apology. That's a remorse. I, I'm sorry I got caught. I'm sorry it had consequences. I'm, I want to escape the consequences. That's my motive here. No, your motive is you want to reestablish the relationship because that's what's been violated. And so when I go to someone, I realize that my responsibility is to accept the fact that I have hurt our relationship. And so why am I sorry about this? Why am I, why am I apologizing? Well, because I, I accept my responsibility in what I did or what I said or what I didn't say or what I didn't do and what I didn't keep my word or I didn't whatever. And that has violated our relationship. So I don't go to someone and say, if I offended you, that's not an apology. If I offended you, no, I know I offended you. That's right. No, don't come to somebody and say, uh, oh, by the way, if, if I hurt you, I'm sorry. Y you know you hurt them. So don't say come with this if kind of stuff. That's basically saying, I don't, you know what that's saying? That is saying, I don't really think I did anything wrong. But because you're so childish and, 
you know, I'm going to apologize because evidently this hurts your little tender feelings and they're just on the edge. So it's really your fault, but I feel like I need to apologize. And not really because I'm just saying if I did, then I'm sorry for what I did. No, 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 no. An apology is I know what I did. An apology is, look, whether, whether I was right or wrong, I could have been completely right. You could have been completely wrong. But I know that what I did didn't come across the way I intended it to do, if, if that's the truth. If that's the truth, sometimes we did come across like, like we really wanted to, and it, and it did, but it still damaged the relationship. But, I mean, it, even if, it, if your intention was not to, to hurt like that, uh, it was received that way. So you could have come at another direction. You could have sprinkled a little salt on it. You could have been more graceful in what you said or what you did. But you realize that you damaged the relationship. So I'm apologizing because we have a relationship and we have a covenant. And I know that what I did hurt that. And I, I'm extremely <coughs> sorry that, I, that, that, that it hurt that relationship. So please forgive me for, for what I've done so the relationship can be reestablished. Matthew 5 says, uh, yeah. What? Oh, you had a, okay. I'm sorry, Bree. I'm sorry, baby. They're asking your opinion. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, as an example, here, here's the, the, the thinking about this. All right. We have a relationship. Let's just say that with any of you guys and me, all right, our relationship is that I'm your pastor, that you hear me, that God wants us to have a relationship where you can hear what I say and it would matter to you and it would mean something to you. So there's a relationship that we have with each other based on the fact that you would respect me as someone who loves you and someone who cares for your soul and someone who would... Uh, want to lead you forward and be an example to you and be someone you could believe in and somebody you could trust and somebody you feel loves you and has your best interest at heart. All right, so that's the relationship that we have. And you come and you hear and you submit yourself to me because that's our relationship. Well, let's just say uh, I come to you and I ask your opinion about something and then you give it to me you, you tell me what I'm asking you about, and then I respond back to you, and it hurts you simply because I don't agree with what you say or I don't think you're, you're, want, you're doing right or whatever, and I'm correcting you or I'm responding to what you just said to me in a, in a certain way, and it hurts you. I mean, it, it, it violates our relationship because it doesn't seem to be uh, with that I respond with the thought in mind that you trust me, that you believe in me, that I'm important in your life, that what I say goes straight to your heart, and I don't, and what I'm, what I did in response didn't seem to have that consideration, and so it's like, oh my goodness, I didn't expect that, I didn't, you know, goodness, man, the pastor, he, you know, he hurt me, he doesn't like me anymore, and he just, you know. And I realize this because I can see it on your face, you know, or I can tell by the way now you're around me, you're not, I mean, there, I can tell there's a breach in our relationship because now you're a little more standoffish because now you're, you know, you're, you're, you're a little bit withdrawn. You've missed church two or three times and you're just, you know, last day school about what's going on in life. Well, I see, okay, obviously there's been some breach here of our relationship. All right, what should I do? What should I do as a leader, as a child of God, as an example, as somebody who is more, maybe more mature, who has a responsibility before the Lord? Well, it's my responsibility to go to you and say, obviously we've had, you know, I've hurt you, and I'm so sorry that I did, and I apologize for that because I love you, and I want our relationship to be tight, so please forgive me for, you know, what I said or for what I did, and what am I apologizing for? Am I apologizing for what I said or the fact that what I said wasn't right or the fact that what I said wasn't good or something like that? No, I'm not apologizing. I'm apologizing for the fact that what I said hurt you. 
So it messed our relationship up. I'm apologizing for the fact that I violated our relationship. So that means I should have said it in another way. I should have been more circumspect. I should have sprinkled a little salt on it. I should have been more graceful in what I said and the way I said it and how I came across. So the law of apology says that there are lots of things in life that are going to be chances for us to hurt each other and to violate our relationships. And so the law of apology says, notice this. Be careful about this. Be quick on this. I guarantee you, if you know, a lot of times you know, you can see right there on the spot, man, this just did not work. This was, I, this, I hurt this. Go ahead right then and say, oh, listen, hon, I, I see that, gosh, man, I'm sorry. I see that I hurt you by what I said. I, I'm sorry. I don't want our relationship to be strained. Please forgive me for hurting you and violating you like that. And, and then the rift can be repaired, and you, you could come at it from another, give it another shot. You know, you realize, okay, hey, what I said, I really want to convey this, but I need to be more gentle about it. I need to recognize that didn't accomplish the purpose. What is your purpose? I mean, is your purpose to try to hurt somebody, try to punish them, try to make them feel like they're dumb or, or immature or what? No, your, your, your purpose as a more mature, as a, as, a, as a person who is going to speak for the voice of God, a person who has a lot of experience and you want to pass that experience on to somebody, that, what is your motive? Your motive is to try to change whatever conduct is going on. So you need to realize that if you've spoken and, it, and it's been hurtful and it's been violating of the relationship, that, okay, you need to back up, be a little more thoughtful about how you're going to say what you say, be more gracious. You can share the same truth in a little bit better way, in a little bit more gentle way, sprinkle a little more salt on it, and, and you can accomplish your motive. It, the first thing that you need to ask yourself in any situation, now listen, and this is going to be true about everything in life. The first question you ask is, what do I want out of this situation? What do I want? Do I want them to change? Do I want them to move forward? Do I want to grow them? Or do I want to punish them? Do I want to hurt them? Do I want to, you know... Uh, make them know how mad I am about something. So decide what it is you want. And then if what you're doing is not giving you what you want, then change what you're doing. What, what's, the, what's, the old, uh, what's the law of insanity? Law of insanity is to keep doing the same thing and expect different results. If you keep doing the same thing, you're going to keep having the same results. So what is it you want? well, I want them to love me. I want them to obey me. I want them to, to take advantage of my knowledge. I want them to uh, respect my words and respect my, okay. Well, is what you're doing giving you what you want? Well, no, it's offending them. It's hurting them. It's killing them. It's running them away. Okay, so that's not giving you what you want, right? Okay, well, what do you need to do to change what you're doing that will give you what you want? And then do it. Don't be so prideful and stubborn and hard-headed that you think, I, bless God, they're going to respond no matter what. I'm, I'm not changing. I'm doing it. No, 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 no. Be wise. Understand that, you know, the, what you say with your mouth, what you transmit with your, you know, your facials, your countenance, your, you know, your life is communicating to people. And is it giving you what you want? And change it if it's not. Back up and punt. You know, get a mulligan. No, apologize. <laughs> apologize because really a lot of times it's not what, I mean, you're not, you don't, you don't feel that what you said was wrong. That, you know, you need, you still need to say what you said, but you don't want to violate the relationship. I mean, you don't want to come across and have your words not received because you just weren't gracious with the way you came at it. You still love them. You still want to have a relationship. You don't want to be at odds and, and, and all with each other. But you do need to, you know, to speak the truth. And that's what I'm talking about, being hard to speak the truth in love. That is difficult. Sometimes you've got to, re sometimes you got to back up and punt, you know, and then come at it again. And uh, 
get another shot, you know, get a mulligan, reset that thing, and the law of apology will allow you to do that. Come with the, with the, with the words of your lips, you know, what is your what is your gift? It's the words of your lips. What is what is it that's going to change things? It's the words that come out of your mouth. You know, be quick with them to uh, recognize that, and to, and the quicker you can do that, the better it's going to be because you let that thing ride, and you give the enemy a chance to build up a wall of defense with somebody, and then it makes it harder, and then it's like, oh, I dread doing this, and then you put it off, and then it goes another day, and then you put it off again because you really don't want to do that, and, you, and before you know it, a week or two weeks or three weeks, and then they're gone because their relationship has been violated, and you don't ever get a chance to speak it anymore. Do it quickly. Recognize it on the spot. Say, oh, baby. I mean, when you see, when you, when you see somebody and you can tell their countenance just mm, drops, you know, and you can tell, all right, what, what does that tell you? That tells you, mm, man, I just violated our relationship. <laughs> let, me, let me back up, baby. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say that like that. And please forgive me for that. Would you, would you forgive me? And yes, Pastor. Okay. Now I'm going to say that same thing again, but I'm going to say it in a little bit different way, a little gentler, a little more graceful a little salt, sprinkle a little more salt on it, make it palatable, you know. and Because you can say anything to anybody if you say it in the right way, you know. Especially if they love you and they appreciate you and they value you and they honor you and they respect you. Uh, you can say stuff to people that is hard if you say it in the right way. And so be careful about that. These are the laws of the mouth. This is what you say with, the, with your lips. Uh, and so anyway, there you go. All right, any, any, other, any words about that? Anybody want to tell me I'm crazy or whatever? No, you're right. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. I think any time that you feel anybody's own, you put them on the defense. Right. You have lost Right. Anything you say. Right, and you need to recognize that quickly, right? right. Yeah. And I'm sorry, you don't have a lot of buts and ifs on it. Yeah, there ain't no but. I'm sorry, but. Now, when you say I'm... <laughs> I'm sorry, but, or I'm sorry, if means I don't think I'm wrong. I think you're a crybaby, but, right. you know, that's what comes across, right? Yeah. So get that but and, and if out of there. Yeah, and they don't hear what you say. And they're really hurt because they, it seems like you don't care about the relationship. You hurt them, and you don't care that you hurt them. And so it's a violation, you know. I mean, who, who's the more mature? Who's the, who's the one that's led by the Spirit of God? You know, I know a lot of times people say, well, somebody might apologize, but it ain't going to be me. I'm telling you who it's going to be. The one that's closest to God, that's the one who's going to be the one that apologizes. Because the one that's led by the Spirit of God, that's going to be the one. The one that's the more mature walking with the Lord, that's going to be. It may be somebody, man, I mean, well, yeah, you, if you're the less immature, if you're the one that's, that's not close to the Lord, then you keep up with that attitude. But God says if, it, if you're responsible for leadership and all that, hey, God holds you accountable and responsible for that. Y'all have kept me talking 45 minutes too long. No, 15 minutes too long. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right, y'all ready? All right, let's stand as we'll be dismissed. Follow